So, so uh, hello and welcome to everyone. My name is Tim Yao. I'm a member of the Nokia Mobile Networks CTO and also a member of the Intersource Patterns Group in the Intersource Commons community. And I want to welcome you all to our webinar, Intersource Patterns, Solving Intersource Problems by Leveraging the Community. Uh, please note that we will be recording most of the session. It's re being recorded now. This uh, recording will be published on the Intersource Commons website, and we are assuming that you consent to this recording of the session. The uh, Intersource Commons is an open source styled knowledge sharing community comprising over 60 companies and institutions. It uses two in-person summits each year. Uh, the next one is uh, Geneva, April, I want to say 18th through the 20th. Um, to do uh, the knowledge sharing, and it has over 140 members in the Slack channel. Uh, all spoken and written communications within the Intersource Commons are governed by the Tatham House Rule that allows people to use the information that is exchanged in me meetings um, and written communications so long as there is no attribution without explicit permission. Um, and all published information that, that comes out, you know, the, the, like the patterns that we're, we'll be doing, um, this is freely made available under the Creative Commons Share Alike Attribution 4.0 International License. Okay, so uh, today we're going to be going over the patterns approach to Intersource. Uh, using Intersource patterns gives, gives us a product that drives that well-known open source cycle of develop, publish, use, and contribute. And the uh, abstraction and organization uh, from the Intersource patterns makes it easier for a company to uh, adapt a proven solution from other companies. Um, the pattern format is also useful as a donut to tease out solutions where no proven solutions are known. Um, just as donuts have no center, a donut pattern provides everything except for the solution. Um, the team that uh, created today's webinar, have uh, we've prepared some videos on intersource patterns, and we hope that you've had an opportunity to view these. If you did not, uh, don't worry. You can always uh, view them later. Yeah, YouTube is not going away. <laughs> and uh, all of our presentation materials uh, will be posted along with uh, the final video. And you can see the, the link here to the, the channel. But that's uh, available. OK. Uh, the, this is uh, the plan for today. We're right now in the opening. Um, we'll, we'll proceed then with a round table introduction of participants. Um, and then uh, Georg and, and Bob will do a pattern walkthrough. And then Nick and Daniel will create a donut pattern using GitHub. Uh, to kind of demonstrate uh, how, to, how to use GitHub um, for that uh, solution. And then uh, Aaron and, and I and uh, Padma uh, will, will go through the pattern uh, writing exercise. OK, so at this point, um, we're going to go through um, introductions. So let me pause the uh, recording. All right, we are, are now uh, recording again. So at this point, I'm going to turn over control to Georg and Bob for the pattern walkthrough. Georg and I, we're going to go through an example pattern and uh, give you an idea of what goes into a pattern and what a pattern looks like. So next slide you can see the whole pattern here and it's not real big it's um, a good introductory size pattern um, i've been around the pattern community for a long time and patterns start you know this size and might evolve to be many pages um, but our, this is a very useful size because it's something that can be um, reviewed and and understood concisely and easily um, at any given time. Um, so the title of this pattern is Common Requirements, and we will 
be looking more at what that means as we go through. Um, so you're going to see eventually that this is becomes the solution to the pattern. And sometimes the titles represent the solution. Sometimes the titles represent the problem. Sometimes the titles are catchy titles. And there's a place for each of them, although I recommend from experience to kind of stay away from the catchy titles, unless everyone in the community knows what that means. So here's the problem statement. The common code is in a shared repository that isn't meeting the needs of all the projects that want to use it. So this is a real problem. I mean, this seems pretty straightforward. The repo there is a repository, so that's a good thing, but it isn't meeting the needs of the projects that want to use it. Um, and problems don't exist in isolation. They exist inside some context. The context is the next section that we're going to look at, and it's the things that can't be changed. They're like the unmovable walls in a building architecture, um, you know, and in systems, we have the same kinds of things, that, the base assumptions and constructs that we absolutely can't change. Sometimes it's organizational that we can't possibly work on this part of the system because that other organization does it and, and so on. So let's take a look at the context. So, so this is the whole context, but we'll break it down and we'll look at it in, in smaller chunks. Um, one of the pieces of context is there's common code that's contributed. Um, it's contributed by someone, some project at some point in time. There is a shared repository, so that's something that you know, we've already got something going. We're trying to share code and we've got the repository built, so that's a good thing. Um, the pattern works in cases of either strong or weak code ownership. And then many projects are trying to use the same code. But the common code, what we're talking about, are only small bits. They're only small services, or they're only small corners, or they're very well-defined corners of an overall product. And so, you know, there's a whole lot of other stuff going into it. Okay, so that's, you know, the context as written. And to look at it at a meta level, um, you know, these are the key things that the project that define the project and projects that are trying to use the common code. So they've already created a repository. There's already some code in the repository. Um, we can envision kind of two ways that inner source code might develop, you know, just like with open source. There can be a strong owner like Linus, or there can be a consensus community um, where everyone, you know, there's a maybe a bigger team that decides on what's going into it. So the context states that the problem exists in either of these cases. The bulk of the products being delivered by the customers isn't the shared code. It's only a small part. The context is also telling us that each project needs lots of specialized code so that it isn't built mostly of the inner source code, you know, for better or worse as we would say in the community. Um, and so these are the things that can't change or that are really, really hard to change, um, you know, bigger than solving this problem that we were confronted with. Patterns also describe things that can change. And these are the trade-offs that can be made to achieve a solution. So now we're going to take a look at them. Um, we call them the forces. And we call them forces because the patterns came out of the, the building architecture community where we're talking about forces like wind and gravity and the force of the earth upward. And now I'll turn it over to Georg. Okay. <clears throat> so this is the complete forces section of the pattern. And uh, I'll summarize it now so you don't have to read everything. 
So the first uh, group of forces here is that the customer needs are generally similar, but they're not exactly the same. Uh, the second one is that the customer needs are weighed or expressed differently between the customers. And the third one is that many customers want the suppliers actually to help them know what they really need. So looking at these forces, you'd think that the customer requirements from different customers would be the same or similar. So maybe this isn't that hard a problem, right? But different customers might say the same thing in different ways. One is focusing on how a system appears to the user. Another focuses on the administrators. Um, how do we you know, reconcile these differences? So looking at these things from different perspectives might make the common assets look usable or, or unusable. And sometimes the customers want the software supplier to tell them what they want. Um, this leads to decision making to the supplier. So can the recommendation be tailored to support the use of inner source? Well, maybe. So. Okay, then here's the next group of forces. Uh, the needs of the project's contributing code are similar, but not the same needs as other projects. So there's also a difference here. And the systems engineers, they are responsible for deriving and distilling the product requirements. Right. So the requirements of the projects are written by a group of people that the supplier has, that the software supplier, that specializes in just that sort of thing. If there are people that specialize in this, can they help ensure that the customer needs for multiple products for the same things are expressed in the same way? Because that it sure helps solve our problem. So finally, um, the reuse has been defined by the company as a, an important goal to reach. As a long yeah, time. and it's a really important and it's really important to save money in the software development. So that inner so the inner source needs to be used. So what can we do to solve this problem? These have been the forces or trade-offs. These are the things that we can maybe change or adjust to solve the problem. We have customers that want the same things but maybe they don't realize it. And we have people that capture the requirements for the customers. So what's a solution that has worked in this context and with these forces? Well, this brings us to the next section of the pattern, the solution section, which is, I guess, the, where, it gets, where it gets interesting. Again, I'm gonna summarize here. <clears throat> um, the solution is quite simple. Um, so first of all, we have to somehow align the project requirements. Uh, second uh, solution is that we influ have to influence the customer requirements. And the last more technical solution is that we have to decompose the code in order to make it better fit the requirements and the variabilities in the requirements. Aha. If we can align the project requirements so that the customers are all happy with the same thing and that thing is available from inner source, then using the inner source would be very logical and cost effective. So. Let's build on the desire of the customers wanting to be told what they want or how we can help them to solve their problems to steer them towards solutions inner sources can help with. So that leads to a new problem space and the next section. Okay, we're uh, almost done with the pattern. Next section is the resulting context. Um, and here it is. What we've just seen in the solution might require negotiating requirements changes with the customer. It might also require um, another involvement uh, by the sales team, for instance, and the product managers to get them align their requirements. Okay, so when it's all said and done, we've moved from the original context where projects can't share artifacts because they need to be slightly different to satisfy their customers into a new context where inner sourcing might be possible. We might need to renegotiate with our customers to agree to these revised requirements that support inner source. And this might take not just the system as engineers, but the salespeople. So while we solve this problem, we've maybe introduced some new problems that we have to solve, but hopefully these will be easier problems and we will come closer to the goal of being able to reuse the inner source. Okay, this is almost the last thing. So there is the author of the pattern. In this case, Bob himself authored this pattern. And as you can see here, it's uh, gone through a couple of review iterations already. Right, and as Georg said, this pattern has been reviewed several times and will continue to be reviewed and refined to make it clear, understandable, and, and most of all, useful. 
I mean, patterns are use. If they aren't useful to someone, then why bother write, writing them? If you have thoughts or suggestions to improve this pattern today, please contact me on the Intersource Pattern Slack channel, and I will incorporate them. And now back to Georg. Okay, so let's take a step back <clears throat> and uh, look at the big picture really briefly. So in the original context, the requirements for, say, customer A and B, as stated in the requirements document that were produced by the systems engineers, have only little commonality indicated here by the little green uh, overlay. And uh, this is due to a number of forces which have been, uh, which are induced by various internal and, and external stakeholders, which are described in the forces section. And this pattern adds additional forces. And uh, these, for instance, internal and external negotiations, the incentives, decomposing the software, and these new forces change the balance, of the overall balance of forces in such a way that the amount of common requirements is maximized. So, um, and thereby it solves or at least lessens the original problem. And yeah, that's, I hope that illustrates how patterns work in general. And that's really it. We've now, you've now seen all the sections of the pattern and hopefully this has given you a first insight in to what patterns actually look like and you know what we're working on. And uh, now I'm gonna hand it over to Nick, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, hello, Nick. You guys hear me good? See my screen? Yes. Okay, yep. thanks. So, uh, hi, I'm Nick Yates. Um, a little, little bit about me, I'm a community manager by trade, uh, open source community manager by trade, and uh, re most recently spent the last couple of years at Red Hat, where I helped implement two inner source uh, solutions. Um, so I'm interested in this area and have been helping out with the pattern groups as of recently. So thanks, Georg and Bob, for kind of giving us an explanation of uh, an example and an explanation of how patterns generally work. And, uh, and then Bob's example there. Um, so we want to kind of shift gears now. And uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of help create a start into uh, towards a discussion uh, of a pattern that we're going to make live right here in the webinar. Um, so uh, I want to give a quick explanation, though, as to how you do that on, on our tool, GitHub, that we're, where we're storing all of our patterns. Um, so first, I want to show that we've got our GitHub pattern, our GitHub uh, repository here, inner source patterns. <coughs> and we've got a readme, pretty standard. Um, and we'll be jumping into the how to contribute document, which is a link off of the readme. Um, so let me go into there real quick. We've kind of got a, a, a brief number of links here at the top uh, to give you an overview on how you might jump in and help us the best, um, and uh, a selection of four different um, options down here. Uh, writing a new pattern, so if you're creating a new pattern from, from scratch, how do you go about doing that on our GitHub site? Uh, discussing recording early ideas which we're going to dump, jump to Daniel here in a second, and he's going to tell us about that. Uh, reviewing existing, existing patterns. So existing patterns uh, are, are lay in our pull requests and how you would help review and uh, give contributions to existing ones and talk about them, discuss them. And also finally taking part in uh, the various meetings and roles that we have inside the patterns community. So uh, I want to hand the mic over to Daniel while I control uh, to talk about kind of recording uh, early ideas. What I mean by that is that um, it's an idea that uh, you've got to say that you're, you're new to the community and, and you're not sure if, uh, if, if a pattern or should be even in this or um, you're not sure how to attack it or think about it. Uh, this would be a good uh, method to go about kind of asking questions or, or initially figuring out where stuff, uh, how it might work with you. Go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, so thank you, Nick. So this is Daniel. I'm also part of the Inner Source Commons. Uh, well, basically, uh, as a first step, if you are interested in joining the community and so on, there's a Slack channel and the group's mailing list. So please go ahead. There's information in the website. Then uh, maybe we have discussed about several concepts here, like the problem statement, context, forces, or solutions. So the point is that you might not be there. Uh, comfortable with those concepts or how to proceed uh, as a first step here. So that's the reason because we are using ISUS. So uh, for this, basically, you can see on the top the ISUS uh, tab. 
If you click there, uh, there, there, there are a bunch of them with using several labels like a non pattern or early idea. Uh, basically, if you want to start some early discussion about some ideas you have, you click on the new issue button on the top right. Um, and there you will see that you, you will start some, some small, let's say, post there. So basically, you need to decide the title, meaningful one. So maybe uh, this idea of I have some engineer is not listening or some any other issues that you may have to face within your companies. And the idea is you provide a meaningful title and then you provide some context and some problem statement if possible. Then our work here as, as community members is that we will help you uh, to drive from all of this. Please remember to use as a label uh, the label early idea or idea, yeah, early idea is there, and um, then basically submit the new issue. So this will be assigned to any of us, and then we will proceed and, and help you. Then if you feel that you are uh, a more advanced user than this, uh, basically Nick will drive you around the pull request. So the point is that you will have to open a pull request, and then we will see how this, how this works. So Nick, please. So now we're going to take on the point of view that uh, we're actually live creating a new uh, pattern here. And so we're writing a new pattern. Uh, I'm not going to uh, read through all these instructions, but I'm actually going to lead us through them. So you start at the top of the repository. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly to save some time. Create a new file. Uh, you can name your file. We're actually doing a pattern on called not invented here. MD is a markdown format. And uh, I've already got open kind of a skeleton file here that's got all the different sections. Now you'll notice here these match what uh, uh, Georg and, and Bob are going through the problem statement, the context, the forces. This is just a blank one that you can grab a, a, a template file. I'm going to paste it in there. And I've got a little bit of a sentence on a problem statement around not invented here. Uh, perfectly good solutions are being rejected because of not invented here. Engineers and their managers will choose to implement functionality themselves, even if an alternative exists, as in even if an alternative in uh, open source within the company or open, so, uh, open source, uh, it does exist. So I'm going to paste that in there. That's what we'll kind of start with as a nugget. I'm going to be handing this off in a little bit to Erin and her team to then kind of discuss with the rest of us uh, and try to kind of brainstorm around filling in the rest of, of, of this pattern. Let's scroll down. <clears throat> you can type in a commit here. Create a new file. Create a new file. You can type detail if you want. We're not going to spend the time right now. Uh, because I'm a trusted com contributor, I get to do a new branch. You might not always get this option, but let's go ahead and make a new branch. Can we say propose new file? Uh, by the way, um, this is one very simple method about interfacing with GitHub. Uh, obviously, you can also do all of this via the command line, and we have instructions for that on our contributing site. Uh, so you're creating a, a new, I'm going to call this I invented here. So we're making a pull request, and this is going to say, hey, Patterns community, uh, I have some content that I've drafted up. I'm going to put it out there. Now, it does not need to be complete whatsoever. Uh, it can be just the start of an idea, and uh, it, you can very easily add to any pull request or branch. Um, and I usually, in the uh, explanation of the, the pull request, put kind of a brief summary of what it's even about, because people will be sometimes coming through here and, and looking at that as a quick uh, eye to understand what it is. You can add reviewers. Um, but you really don't need to worry about these if, if you're not sure as to how what labels to put on. But um, on this one, we'll say that it's incomplete for now, and a donut, as in it lacks a solution. We have a problem, but no solution. That's kind of the maturity of it right now. And we're going to create this pull request. OK, mm -hmm. uh, so we have a pull request out there. We actually have 13 of them. You can see them here, a whole bunch of them in different uh, states. Um, and we've got the not invented here, one at the very top there. I'm going to hand it off to Aaron and Tim to uh, jump into a discussion with the rest of uh, the group here about this. Thanks, Nick. So um, my name is Erin Bank, and one of the programs that I manage is an intersource program for, um, for engineers. 
And as Nick mentioned, uh, we'd like to walk through each section of this donut that Nick was just referring to to give you a better idea of how you can contribute. And I welcome your collaboration, so I'll be pausing for, for input and, and your thoughts, and we can brainstorm on this topic. So um, I know Tim is going to, to actually bring up the actual donut and, and capture our discussion as we go along. Um, but before we delve into that, uh, we start with a problem statement. So we should probably discuss what is meant by not invented here. Uh, would anyone like to speak to that? Does anyone have thoughts on what not invented here refers to? I don't mind having a go. <laughs> this is uh, Steve. Um, I, I believe, I, yeah, yeah. So I think I've experienced this firsthand where engineering teams um, feel that they are, I guess, a special snowflake. Um, <laughs> there might be a nicer way of putting it, um, but would refuse to use even um, established open source software because it doesn't meet their precise needs. I think it may also have something to do with wanting, to, just wanting to write everything from scratch and being so into the idea of engineering and, and software development that you just want to own everything and write everything yourself. So there's some resistance to using someone else's solution, either because you think you're special or you, you just have this innate desire to write it yourself. That's, I think, how, I would, how I've seen it. That's not I'd really like to say it's not limited. Yeah. I'd like to say it's not limited to engineers. It's not. It's not just knock engineers. <laughs> I think it's a yeah. human thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a common mindset that, that is seen, and and as Steve was talking about it, it it could be you know just just a feeling that that something that is created in house or, or by you is is just going to be superior or maybe more secure or maybe you can do it more quickly, or, or it's going to be cheaper. Um, you know, trust can also be an issue. We trust our team and our code. We haven't worked with you to establish trust, so your code might be sketchy. It might break our bill in, in, you know, in the, uh, from the perspective of an engineer. So there could be many concerns that lead to this mindset. And some are valid and some are irrational. Um, any other feedback on not invented here or thoughts that people want to share before we move on? and take a look at the problem statement. Okay. So the problem that's been put forth here is that because of not invented here, good code is being rejected. Does that problem resonate with anyone? I know I've seen this. <laughs> I think, I think we've, we've definitely seen it here at Nokia. Same here. One thing to add, Erin, would be that if you, you know, do not reuse stuff and reinvent everything again, you maybe also make the same mistakes all over again. You basically you forego a chance to learn and iterate and get better at the stuff. It's always the first iteration of everything if you do it this way. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And 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 the problem statement is it states that good code is being rejected. But what's the downside of that? What's the impact? And and as you just mentioned, right? It, um, duplicative development, redundancy, um, reinventing the wheel, so, so building the same thing uh, many times in many ways. And, and you're right, if, if, the original, if, um, if the original code um, contains errors and, and there's no collaboration, then, then maybe that's not going to be found. Um, slower time to market, because instead of reusing, you're rewriting. Um, if it's internal code, no trust is being built through collaboration. And this can hinder open innovation, and maybe missing out on on better technology. So okay. maybe we add to the problem statement that as a result, developers are incurring costs and time writing redundant, possibly inferior code, and are missing opportunities to establish the trust that could lead to more open innovation. Because that's why we really care about you know the code being rejected. Any further and, thoughts on that before we get into the context? Yeah, so I have a question. Um, so when we define a problem, you know, what kind of information do we actually put in there? Because when we were talking about, when Bob and Georg were talking about how to write patterns, 
the takeaway was that the problem statement would just talk about the problem, not so much about the results. So what is the right approach here? I think that's a good question, and I would steer that towards, um, towards Bob or one of the pattern aficionados. What I always like to do when I start with anything, well, first I ask who's my customer, but then I, I ask what problem am I solving? And I, and I, I think about what the problem is and I ask why, why do I care, right? What's the impact? So um, I think it's something, a good thing to focus on um, whether uh, you want to include it in the problem statement or not. Um, I would probably go back to, like I said, the pattern aficionados to tell us the do's and don'ts there. Does anyone have input? And putting the, pro putting the, the whys in the problem statement, that, that's reasonable. The whys might also come out in the context um, because you're, it's kind of laying out the field of what, where the problem exists. You know, why, why do we have this problem? And it's because of the context we're in. Well, one thing that helps me, if I might, that is, uh, what happens if we don't apply the solution or if we don't uh, uh, do something about the situation? Then, then we come towards the impact, uh, and this is something that usually hurts, uh, uh, or it should it should describe should be described in a way that is slightly painful, so that it triggers, uh, hey, we have to do something about that. Agreed. Yeah, that can help re really drive the point home as, as to why it's a real problem, and maybe create a sense of urgency towards solving it. Thank you. All right, so let's get so into the conclusion, the context. Erin, so the conclusion I heard is it's a good idea to put the impact here, right? Yeah. I think it can think be helpful, did. yes. Okay. Thanks, Padma. It's a great question. So speaking of the context, um, the context will tell us the pre-existing conditions. So these are things that we're not able to change. Uh, things like company size or a company that has a history of acquisitions. And these are things that are contributing uh, to, to the problem uh, that are just sort of facts that you're, you're not going to be able to move. So depending on the person who's contributing this actual donut, they, they, would, be, they would have a specific context. Um, and I have some thoughts to share on this, but first I'd like to open it up. Um, would anyone like to share their thoughts on what the context might be here that could be contributing to this? Uh, traditional development teams that maybe just aren't even used to uh, how open uh, communities can work. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe uh, yeah. strong silos in the company. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm which usually comes from an excess of ownership culture. An ownership culture, yeah. I would say egos, but is egos really a context or a force? Can you change mm -hmm. egos? That's a good question. <laughs> Some might argue that so, so contexts are things you can't change and forces are things you can. And, some might argue that you can't change egos, and some might argue that you can. I would think of it more as a force, and I would be optimistic and hope that, that there are things that you could do to move that, but maybe not always. <laughs> okay, so we've talked about a history of siloed engineering teams, mature, entrenched engineering culture that might have an ownership mindset, um, no history of using inner source code uh, from other teams within the company, um, little to no history maybe of, of using open source from third parties. So, so not, you know, no experience with this. And um, egos might come into play here too, some of which might not be movable. So we'll move on to forces now. And forces are things that make the problem challenging to solve and are constraints, but they can be changed or maybe they can be traded off, but most likely at a cost. So we mentioned egos. And, and that could be team egos or individual egos. Um, what are some other things that make not invented here syndrome um, difficult to solve, but that could possibly be changeable? Um, I, if I could add one, which is perhaps related to strong egos, but it would be in something I've seen, just an unwillingness to work with others. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've seen that too. 
So, a force we haven't discussed yet is um, a belief or, or reality that there's excessive time pressure and learning something new is going to take time away from the prime directive of getting the code written. Yeah, that's a big one, <laughs> for sure. Another thing I've seen is um, no incentive. Uh, so, you know, they, they're being measured a certain way, and there's no incentive for them to contribute to someone else's project or even to consume. Yeah, I think that gets towards towards the solution, too. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. that's a big one. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on forces before we move on? I think lack of trust, maybe. I think you, you may have mentioned it earlier. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. I mean, it could also be that the software is actually, it cannot be reused. I mean, do we mention this here, or is it something that goes into the context? Maybe it has just not been built for reuse. Actually, I think that is a good force, and, and that's certainly something that, that you see. If, if, um, if it's going to take such a great deal of effort to get the code into the state where it could be consumed, that, that could definitely be a force. Mm -hmm. Could also be a, a, there could also be a, a fear of losing control. I mean, as long as you are doing your own solution, you have full control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially with project managers, right, who want to be able to deliver a product on time. and Right, timeline, timeline constraints. Mm -hmm. back, back in the topic of whether the code is yeah, back in the topic of whether the code is ready to consume, um, there's also the question of whether the team is, or the architecture of the thing that's doing the consuming can accept code. So we often see uh, monolithic architectures have a harder time accepting intersource code because the you know the lack of modularity makes them brittle. Very good one. Yeah. And similar to the problem, uh, no? lack of modularity, Tim, I think you want to capture lack of modularity there. And I'm sorry, uh, I think I spoke over someone. Uh, yeah, maybe security can be a problem. Security? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think we see that there, are, there could be a long laundry list of forces. Uh, that contribute to this, and, 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 and that's a good thing because it, it gives you opportunities to see which levers you can pull to maybe make some, some movement here. Uh, let's see, so we're coming to the, to the bottom of the hour. Um, in terms of the solution, um, I recently read a good blog by Awana Maria Pop, who is a researcher in open innovation at the Hasselt University in Belgium, and it touched on this topic. And she provided what she referred to as a prescription to improve the self-optimal decision-making that results from not invented here. And the first part of the prescription that she gave was to first acknowledge that not invented here exists, and then assess its current impact on your open innovation efforts. So in other words, how many opportunities have you missed uh, because of this? So the next part then is, is building explicit incentives to overcome uh, things like reward programs, and, and we mentioned this um, when we were talking about, about context. Um, engaging people outside of um, the organization in the strategy and evaluation phases to receive fresh perspectives on, on your projects. I also saw an interesting video by DMS, which is a Dutch sciences company, about shifting from the restrictive not invented here to the all-empowering proudly found elsewhere approach. And, and I'll, I'll end with this. They say it pays to look outside one's own area, finding others with technology that can help move projects forward. This is called open innovation. And instead of the solid walls of the product development funnel, the open innovation funnel has permeable walls. So information and ideas flow in and out. And the result is a greater chance of success. And all that happens much faster. Um, so I wanted to ask if anyone has um, some some success story that they want to share um, and experience with overcoming not invented here. And I know we've got two minutes left. 
So I'm not sure if there's really time to delve into it. Um, anyone have some thoughts they want to share? All right. Um, I, do have well, some, I do have some thoughts, but I will write them down and send them to Bob so he can share them with you. I think that's great. Or, you know, you can, um, you can feel free to um, participate in the community and, and go into this actual pattern and, and make some notes and comments there. Uh, you're more than welcome to do that. You know, that's the, that's the whole point is that we're going to collaborate and work together to solve the problems that we all have. And we're really looking for those um, known instances um, of success that we can share. Um, I'm, so I'm curious that, to hear from, from Steve Winton. He was mentioning that he had seen this in the wild. Steve, did, did you see any solutions or did you guys implement any uh, incentives that, like she was talking about? I wish. Um, I, I tried to get something off the ground, <clears throat> which was to increase collaboration by asking vendors to um, share code with us. Uh, but it it didn't gain traction, unfortunately. So I've seen the problem, but this is the closest I've come to seeing a solution. Yeah, I'm really curious on the explicit incentives. I was trying to brainstorm what kind of incentives you would have. I, th I think we 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 I had touched on some at Red Hat around getting management to uh, uh, different kinds. Of, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's a tough. It's a tough thing to come up with incentives and actually get it to. This is an interesting topic that we should continue discussion on. And if you're interested in joining the patterns community, maybe um, Tim, make, maybe one of the patterns uh, meetings, we can focus on this particular pattern. Since it sounds like yes, it really resonates sure. with, with a lot of people. Okay. Um, so, Erin, is there anything more that you wanted to cover uh, before we bring this to a close? I, I want to be conscious of the time. No, absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Good work, everyone. So, um, we will we will put post what we have, and, and it will include uh, the links that uh, Aaron had to a blog article and video. Um, I just want to make a quick note that uh, putting on this webinar took a lot of contributions from many different people, and so I want to thank everyone that contributed uh, to this effort. Um, and. We want to encourage you to join our, our InterSource Patterns community. Um, if you are you know, really busy and only have 10 seconds, you can just join the Slack channel and the mailing list. Um, if you have 30 seconds, you know, send us a one-liner of what you're working on with in, in InterSource and your problems. Um, it can help guide us. And otherwise, you know, we encourage you to join us directly. Um, join the InterSource Patterns Slack channel. Um, you can ask Cedric uh, Williams at Cedric. Send a direct message to him on the Slack channel, and he'll add you to that. Um, we meet uh, on a biweekly basis. We have fascinating discussions about intersource problems. We break them up into their constituent parts and analyze them and review them. And uh, I, I know we've been learning a lot about intersource just through that. So I, I strongly encourage you to uh, take a look um, and, and do that. Uh, otherwise, um, you know, we will post this video and, and our notes at uh, intersourcecommons.org. Um, and you know, we, we welcome your, your suggestions uh, and uh, involvement in, the, in this effort. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone who attended. Good day. Bye -bye.